terms of strain. If you look at what it could do to our country, these are the numbers from the Department of Health and Human Services. I might add, if it's a severe or moderate like pandemic, 90 million illnesses, 45 outpatient visits, but look at the deaths, 1.9 million. 742,000 people need mechanical ventilators. Right now, we have 105,000 mechanical ventilators in this country. In any one given day, 70, 80,000 are in use. And during the flu season, we get right up to 100,000. We have no capacity in our healthcare system to respond to this, none. This slide really reminds us we can easily go to either camp, chicken little, we're all going to die. Earlier this year, I was on the Oprah show for an hour talking about this with Oprah. And the following day, for the following week, my email system choked the entire University of Minnesota system, practically. <laughs> And the emails fell in one of two categories. Even though it was the same words, the same ugly face, the same message, half of them said, you know what? Guys like you should be hung. You should be fired by your place. You should just go out and shoot yourself for scaring us needlessly. Guys like you are really bad. The other half were over here saying, you're part of the government cover-up. We know this is going to be much worse. We're all going to die. Why don't you just tell us that and be honest? <laughs> you know why we do that? Because that's the easy answer. If you believe it's we're all going to die, take your bottle, go home, get under your covers, we'll come get you when it's done. If you don't believe it's going to happen, just enjoy life. It's the truth that's hard. And this is where it's about you for the kids. What kind of world are we going to leave you? And today, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing almost nothing except giving lip service. At the state level, at the federal level, we have done very little. I just met last week with executives from 10 of the largest trucking companies in the United States. They've virtually done nothing. We held a national summit in February, our center did in Minnesota. The companies there represented almost $4 trillion in annual re in revenues. We heard from the oil refinery companies. All of them were there. They said that if we lose 20 to 30 percent of our workers, we can't continue to run our refineries. Because not only do we have just in time delivery, but we also have just enough employee delivery. We've done virtually nothing to prepare for that. This is going to make Katrina seem mild. Responding to the pandemic, I mentioned the issue about prevention patient treatment. We won't have it. Right now, we have to understand that. We will have to just get through without it, like you do if we had nothing following a Katrina. Our medical response system already is very weakened. We won't have that. I worry desperately how we're going to get pharmaceutical drugs to you. Today, we don't have that pipeline. You can't stockpile if you wanted to. We've got to change that but there's no economic incentive, there's nothing happening to make that happen. I worry whether you'll get your life-saving drugs during a pandemic, not for the pandemic, but for your other condition. In terms of worker patient protection, we're gonna to have to figure out where all healthcare workers come to work. I mentioned earlier 25% of them wouldn't go to work in Toronto with SARS by the eighth week. If you don't have vaccine, you don't have effective drug, and you don't have masks, who's gonna to come to work? Some of you may be doing it in places like this very room, giving care. Corpse management, in 1968, the average time from a casket being made till it was in the ground was almost uh, six months. Today, it's less than 30 days. Crematorium space, just in time delivery. We saw in Katrina, and we saw in the tsunami, when we treat our dead with disrespect, that's what takes us over the edge. We have no plans. Cities like Seattle have gone out and figured out where they can get all the indoor ice arenas they know, and they're going to stack bodies right where you're sitting and hopefully keep them until they can process them. We've done none of that planning here. Implications, food and water, food's a just-in-time delivery system today. I deal with that all the time in the work I do. We have no contingency plan how to get food to people because it is just in time. Domestic international security, again, we just did a survey of prison wardens. Most of them told us if we lose 20 to 30 percent of workers, we don't know how we'll control our prisons. Again, where are the plans for that? We could do it now. Pandemic implications, just imagine a 12 to 18-month global blizzard with mandatory or voluntary closes in national, state, or even local borders. Public panic and 24-7 media coverage will reign. Governments will have limited resources. I believe at least 20 to 30% of people won't go to work. We won't close schools because parents will take their kids out of them. You won't have to close them. Even under the worst case scenario, the world's population will survive, however. We have to start planning how we're going to do that now. So what do we do? Well, it's not a matter of if, just when and where. At a minimum, assume we will not have vaccine for the first six months, then supplies will be limited. If it's a 1918-like scenario, 98 out of 100 of us will get, around, get through it, but we'll still lose 1.9 million Americans and up to 150 million people worldwide. Planning's not an option, yet we keep postponing it. So in conclusion, just let me say, emerging infections are a, real, a reality of our modern world. They are. 
The causes are complex and the solutions are difficult, but there is nothing here that can stop us from doing this. We invest today in things that I have to ask myself over and over again as I go to sleep at night, is this really making the world safer? When I know there are things that will, and we're doing virtually nothing. Hope and despair are not strategies. I believe that so much. Why do I do this? My whole career today can be still down in one very simple answer. I don't do it for the money. I don't do it for the 180,000 air miles I travel a year. I don't do it for this. I do it for my kids. It's about my kids. And it's about you students in this room. You're all that matter. We owe it to our kids to make a difference. I can't think of a more important legacy. Thank you very much.